U.S. embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. An Iranian jetliner shot down by a U.S. warship in the Persian Gulf. The U.S. and Iran disagree over just about everything. States like these constitute an axis of evil. It was the government of the United States that oppressed Iranian people for 50 years. Iran has long been at odds with the United States, but as the world prepares for a historic nuclear deal, the ice between the two nations may finally be thawing. Experience the gripping events both sides must overcome to get there in ABC's A Brief History of U.S.-Iran Relations. Tehran, 1951. After years of foreign governments controlling their oil fields, Iranians looked to reclaim their natural resources. There was a strong feeling amongst the Iranians that the country's most important resource, oil, didn't belong to Iranians, it belonged to the British. So in a move that stuns the West, Iran's democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, nationalizes the Iranian oil industry, previously controlled by the British. England had spent millions to develop this oil, expropriated by Mossadegh. Mossadegh was a quintessential nationalist politician who saw Iran's oil resource being exploited by the British and he simply wanted an equitable deal. The British and the United States took exception to Mossadegh's nationalism and they feared that Iran was veering too close to communism, to the Soviet Union. And so you saw Operation Ajax, the 1953 coup against Mossadegh. That operation is carried out by the CIA's top operative in Tehran, Kermit Roosevelt who orchestrates a coup to replace Mossadegh with Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, a former exiled monarch also known as the Shah. Climaxing a contest for rule, the Shah of Iran returned to Tehran. And what followed then was the Mossadegh went into uh, internal exile. He, he died under house arrest, and the Shah started to rule with a much heavier hand. For the next 20 years, the Shah in the United States grew still closer. The White House is ablaze as the Shah and his lovely queen arrive for a state dinner. Until in the 1970s, Iran became America's strongest ally in the Persian Gulf. At one point, even the single biggest purchaser of American weapons. Americans and Iranians were experiencing a love affair. I do not remember any request we made of him that he refused. The United States uh, saw in Iran as a very important partner for energy, and the Shah saw in the United States a very important partner for, for Iran's security and for security in the Persian Gulf. Four years later, in 1957, the U.S. helped establish the Shah's brutal secret police known as Savak, so brutal that Amnesty International named Iran one of the world's worst violators of human rights. Savak was known to engage in torture, and for that reason it was something that a lot of Iranians feared. And to make matters worse, President Jimmy Carter, known for his human rights initiatives, welcomes the Shah to the White House in 1977. And he toasted the Shah of Iran and said that... Iran because of the great leadership of the Shah is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. There was resentment towards Carter's speech because on one hand he was paying lip service to human rights and on the other hand he anointed the Shah as his, his best friend. He didn't criticize the Shah's human rights records. Unknown to Carter, the Shah's days in power are numbered. It was just a few minutes ago that the word reached here on Shah Reza Street that the Shah had finally left the country. After months of protests against his rule, the Shah leaves Iran for exile on January 16, 1979. And two weeks later, Ayatollah Khomeini arrived in Tehran, and the Shah never returned. Would you be so uh, kind as to tell us how you feel about being back in Iran? <laughs> Meanwhile, a cancer-ridden Shah travels from country to country seeking a temporary residence and medical care before President Carter reluctantly grants him asylum in the United States. Well, Carter was reluctant to 
allow the Shah to enter the United States, fearful that it was going to spark a backlash within Iran. And in some ways, he, he turned out to be prescient. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Iranians had fought U.S. Marine Guards for three hours for control of the embassy. The American hostages were blindfolded, handcuffed, and marched out on the U.S. Embassy's front steps by the revolutionary students. For the next 444 days, 52 Americans are held captive in what becomes known as the Iranian hostage crisis. The chance for the United States to return Shah to Iran and to expect as a price that we will send these people to the United States. I am ordering that we discontinue purchasing of any oil from Iran for delivery to this country. The Iranian hostage crisis essentially sabotaged Jimmy Carter's chances of re-election because this was daily humiliation for the United States. The program Nightline was born as, as a result of the hostage crisis and it showed on a, on a daily basis to Americans how this faraway third world country was humiliating them every single day. Less than a year later, Iraq invades Iran hoping to take advantage of the revolutionary chaos and it ignites the Iran-Iraq war. Iranian shells are now raining ever nearer the Iraqi positions. Henry Kissinger famously said during the Iran-Iraq war, the only problem is that they can't both lose. And when Iran appeared to be winning the war, America tilted towards Iraq. It wasn't just a tilt toward Iraq, it was an opening of the floodgates. Throughout the eight-year war, the U.S. supplies Saddam Hussein and his Iraqi army with intelligence reports, billions of dollars, military technology, even chemical weapons to fight the Iranians. To this day, this is a, a major source of antagonism which Iran's leadership harbors towards the United States. The Iran-Iraq war was the bloodiest battle of the second half of the 20th century. And after eight years of fighting, the boundaries didn't change one inch. During the war, the Iranian-backed Lebanese militant group known as Hezbollah carries out a deadly attack against U.S. Marines barracks in Beirut, killing 241 Americans and further straining U.S.-Iran relations. And then a bizarre twist. In November of 1986, the world learns of a series of secretive arms sales to Iran, an action that would come to be known as the Iran-Contra scandal. That action involved profits of up to $30 million from U.S. arms sales to Iran being secretly funneled to Contra rebels fighting in Nicaragua. President Reagan tries to downplay the arms sales. These modest deliveries taken together could easily fit into a single cargo plane. But the Iranians see it differently. They saw Iran-Contra as an example of U.S. duplicity, that on one hand America is willing to provide Iran arms but on the other hand, um, America was still supporting Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war. Then in 1988, U.S. forces operating in the Gulf commit an atrocity. An Iranian jetliner shot down by a U.S. warship in the Persian Gulf. 290 passengers and crew killed. This man lost five members of his family. He found three of the bodies here. His shock is deep. Well, I think it was an understandable accident to shoot and think that they were under attack from that plane. The United States never apologizes for the incident. Nearly three decades later, the attack continues to color Iranian leaders' views towards America. The Iranian leadership has a long list of past American transgressions, and the shooting down of the civilian airliner is, is, is towards the top of that list. Although Iran pursued refining uranium since the 1950s, with help at times from both the United States and Russia, it wasn't until the mid-2000s that Iran stepped up its efforts to develop nuclear power. Under this president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Here is an Iranian leadership which rejects Israel's existence, it denies the Holocaust, and it has these nuclear ambitions. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror while an unelected few repressed the Iranian people's hope for freedom. Then in 2010, a U.S.-Israeli designed computer worm known as Stuxnet is unleashed on Iranian nuclear facilities. The virus secretly records data of the reactor working properly. 
and plays that back while it's destroying the plant, so operators think everything is okay. Stuxnet sabotaged Iran's centrifuges and, and caused the nuclear program to be delayed. Three years later, Iran finally comes back to the negotiating table where officials begin to outline a partial rollback of the Iranian nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. So we first began negotiating with Iran in 2003, and these negotiations went on and off for the last dozen years. But it wasn't until the election of Hassan Rouhani in 2013 when the dynamics of these negotiations began to change in a serious way. This first step will provide the most far-reaching insight and view of Iran's nuclear program that the international community has ever had. After two years of negotiating with Iran's more moderate leadership, a historic announcement comes from President Obama. Today, the United States, together with our allies and partners, has reached a historic understanding with Iran. The major challenge in nuclear negotiations with Iran isn't reaching a deal between President Barack Obama and President Hassan Rouhani. It's how do you reach agreement between the supreme leader, the real power in Tehran, Ayatollah Khamenei, and the U.S. Congress, which abhors Iran's regional policies. Getting those two actors to sign the same document would prove to be extremely difficult. And even though Iran has provided crucial support in the fight against ISIS, its support for rebels in Yemen poses yet another obstacle for improving relations with the West. If anything is certain, it's that each time the U.S. and Iran meet, both nations have a lot of history to overcome.